Hello and welcome back. This is the week 11 lecture. So we'll shift gears a little bit this week. I would like for us to conclude our weeks long discussion of literary criticism and theory. And also we need to talk at least a little bit about our novel, Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. I would like everybody to have the book finished by the end of this week. So we haven't talked about it yet. I've given you guys about three weeks to finish it. It's not a particularly long novel. So hopefully we're finishing up and we are ready to discuss. I don't really want to do a lot of interpretive work today. I want to leave that up to you guys. But I will just sort of mention a few things to look for. And we can talk about some, poten some different potential approaches we can take if we were to analyze the novel more, perhaps in the future. But let's start by just sort of putting a bow on what we've been doing for the last few weeks. So we've been covering all of these different critical and theoretical approaches, starting with text-based approaches. Then we spent a good bit of time on all of the different context-based approaches. And again, that was not a comprehensive survey. I just covered some of the more popular ones. And then last week we talked about reader-based approaches, which, which you know mostly consists of reader response, criticism, and reception theory. So the last thing to talk about really would be author-based approaches. And I've mentioned this a little bit, at least briefly in previous weeks. This mostly means the biographical approach. And we have talked about this a little bit because it was one of our traditional critical approaches that we had for a long time before the new critics or the formalists came along roughly 100 years ago and pioneered their close reading techniques and sort of got us to start uh, looking at works of literature as works of art that were worthy of analysis in and of themselves, not simply because of what they could tell us about philosophy or theology or history. So we talked about some of those traditional ways of approaching literature, how a lot of scholars or critics would just sort of use another discipline or another field of knowledge as the lens that they sort of use to approach a literary text. But another thing people would often do, and they still do it now, is take the biographical approach where they really focus on connections between the author and the text. So we can do that with Cannery Row, certainly. Uh, we can talk about how Steinbeck might be connected to the time and the place that we see depicted in the novel. And if you do any research, uh, if you decide to write about this novel later for our big literary research paper and you start reading more about it, you're, you're going to see very quickly that a lot of previous scholars and critics have taken the biographical approach. And uh, it's, it's been done, and a lot of good work has been done, and it's really given us a lot more information and insight to work with, uh, you know, when con when constructing our own analysis, but there's just some obvious connections that have already been made. You know, Steinbeck was from Salinas, California, which is very close to Monterey, California. So on a very basic level, he just knows the area. He just knows this part of California. He, he grew up there. He lived there for a time as an adult, uh, for a good part of his adult life. He knew people who lived there. His friends and family were largely there. So he knew the landscape. He knew the terrain, you know, the geography of these places. But he also knows the culture. He knows the people. He knows the customs. He knows a lot about the different ways of life. Uh, that are on display here. So he's obviously bringing a certain level of authentic knowledge to the table. We know that. That's already been proven and demonstrated in a lot of previous uh, you know, work that's been done on the book. So we know that, at least in part, he is drawing on his own life, his own experiences, his own personal history uh, when he writes a lot of his fiction, including... Cannery Row. But we can take a step back and think a little bit more broadly for a moment as well. Like, what do we know about John Steinbeck? He's a famous American author. Most students have to read something by him, you know, at some point. Probably best known for his novel Grapes of Wrath, uh, 
A lot of people have to read that in high school or college, at least that used to be the case. But probably the most read uh, thing that he ever did was Of Mice and Men, which is commonly taught uh, you know, in middle school or high school, you know, generations of American students have read that particular novella or sort of short novel. Um, and, you know, those are probably what he's best known for. But East of Eden was another very famous novel set in Salinas, uh, his hometown, later got turned into a movie starring James Dean. Grapes of Wrath was also turned into a famous movie like back in the 40s. I think East of Eden was turned into a film in the 50s or very early 60s. So Steinbeck was an important artist around the middle of the 20th century. And again, we know Cannery Row was published in 1945. So we know some of his most famous works. Cannery Row belongs to sort of a slightly different branch. I mean, it's famous, certainly. Maybe not as famous as Grapes of Wrath and Of Mice and Men, but it's often classified as one of his Monterey novels. Obviously, it is set in Monterey, but it's also frequently classified with books like Tortilla Flat, Sweet Thursday, other books set in the same place, uh, in some cases featuring many of the same characters, Sweet Thursday does, uh, and featuring sort of similarities in terms of the types of lifestyles on display. These are sort of marginalized characters, sort of living on the margins. They're not exactly what we would call, at least a lot of them, uh, Mac and the boys and Dora and the girls. They're not exactly what we might consider or what, were, what would have been considered back then, respect citizens. They're often sort of fun, eccentric characters with interesting personalities. Many of them are quite smart, quite capable, but they're not sort of like regular working people, right? They're not really nine to five types. And if you look at Tortilla Flat, that's a slightly different milieu, but similar in that, you know, a lot of the characters don't really have steady jobs. They don't have permanent homes. <laughs> uh, you know, they're sort of, uh, you know, vagrants to a certain extent. They're somewhat indigent, but they have fun. Every once in a while, they'll stumble upon some money. They'll have a big party. Uh, there's a lot of com sort of camaraderie, a lot of, you know, uh, sort of powerful bonds of friendship on display. But also the Monterey novels are frequently viewed kind of as a little different in terms of tone compared to, you know, some of his other big works. Often the Monterey novels are thought of as a little bit more comic, a little bit more lighthearted, kind of fun, a little bit irreverent. Um you know, slightly subversive just in the fact that they are depicting characters that, again, back in the 1940s certainly would have been considered maybe slightly immoral um, or, again, just kind of disreputable, like not sort of nine to five regular tax paying citizens. Um, so the books are considered, you know, sort of different in terms of tone, style, a little bit more. Again, lighthearted or jovial, but another thing we might notice as we're reading is that Steinbeck often sort of combines uh, sort of moments of fun and, and humor and friendship. We, we see all of that, but it's often combined with a lot of melancholy and some tragedy and, you know, a certain kind of sense maybe of loneliness at times, or desolation. So even when he's sort of in a comedic mode, like he is here, there's still a, a really wide sort of, you know, extensive tapestry on display. It's not just one note. It's not just one feeling. Uh, so that's important to note. And but anyway, I'm kind of wandering away from his biography. So again, we, we know a little bit about him as a famous American author, but he's also sort of a local regional writer. For much of his career, a lot of his fiction uh, is set in this particular part of California. So we can obviously, you know, think about ways that he's drawing on, on his own life, his own experiences, 
his own knowledge. One thing I mentioned in this week's discussion board, and I wanted to go ahead and just acknowledge it because you guys will find it online very easily, is the fact that Doc, one of our main characters here, uh, some would say he really is sort of the closest thing to the to the true protagonist, maybe, of the novel. I think that's up for debate, but he's certainly one of the principal players. Uh, he was based on a real-life person, Ed Ricketts, a real marine biologist, who Steinbeck knew and was friends with throughout the 1930s and 1940s. So, uh, yeah, that work has been done. You know, a lot of scholars have shown the ways that, you know, Ricketts serves as a basis for this character. But again, I wouldn't say that Doc is a mirror image of the real person. Like a lot of fiction writers, Steinbeck takes these real things, real people, real places, real events and he does sort of what we call like you know putting that veil of fictionality over those real things changing a few details changing names uh making a few sort of creative additions and creating something new out of that uh original material that again is clearly drawn from some biographical sources but what i mean when i say you can pair that biographical approach with other approaches is this if we're going to think about Steinbeck and this place you know this particular setting and you know what it means why it's significant and if we're thinking about that realism again you know critics have said that a lot of the realism the mimesis that we see the mimetic function of the book is largely drawn from you know, the authenticity of lived experience, real experience, real knowledge. Not that Steinbeck lived like the characters live in this novel or the other Monterey novels, but he might have known people like that. He did know somebody like Doc. Um, you know, he might have seen, observed characters like Mac and company. He at least had some knowledge of that milieu, of those types of characters and how they lived, how they talked how they got by. So we can definitely talk about that and you could use that biographical angle really to get you moving on some other stuff, to think more about the details that create a realistic portrait of this time and place. And again, that could get you into dialogue, that could get you into certain aspects of Steinbeck's style, like even things like his sentence structure, the way he describes things. But even, you know, the plot, though it is loose, uh, the things that happen, the characters we meet, all of that can sort of be connected to certain biographical strands. But you could also get launched into a historical examination because if we think about, uh, you know, the Salinas and the Monterey that Steinbeck knew, we're often going to be rooted to a particular time. We're going to be rooted to a particular historical moment, a historical setting. So we know we're in Monterey in this novel, and more specifically, we're on Cannery Row, which is a specific part of Monterey. So if you go to Monterey today, you can still visit Cannery Row. It's kind of been made a little bit into a tourist attraction, and there are notable plaques commemorating Steinbeck and this novel. You can even read a quote, the opening passage uh, you know, the very famous opening to the book. You can read that somewhere on some placard or some plaque on the street. So they've kind of made it a little bit into a memorial or sort of a tribute to Steinbeck and a lot of his fiction. It certainly does not look today like it looked uh, roughly 100 years ago. Back in the early to mid 20th century, this was a very bustling uh, sort of commercial district. This One of the big industries you know, in town really were, it really did consist of the canneries. So literally, Cannery Row was a strip of Ocean View Avenue in Monterey where you had just a bunch of canneries, these big sort of processing plants where they would process fish, mostly sardines, but other fish that they caught in the Monterey Bay. Uh, they you know, caught huge quantities and that stuff would get processed. It would get canned you know, literally in those canneries uh, or in other cases reduced to like fish meal or oil. So this was a major industry in this particular place. 
So it's important that we know that. We don't need to be experts uh, on the canneries or the fishing industry, but we just need to know that that was sort of a primary economic engine in Monterey, really going back to like the early 1900s all the way up until when the last canneries closed over the course of like the 1960s. In 1970. So it's kind of a bygone way of life. We, we don't really have that same industry in that same place, but we used to. It's a part of the history of this place. So we could think about Monterey in general. Monterey as a city has an interesting history as the former capital of Spanish uh, ca uh, of Spanish California. Later, I think it was still the capital when California became the ownership of Mexico, once Mexico became an independent nation. Uh, so there's a whole history that goes back before our Anglo American history in the region, because of course, California was a part of Spain and Mexico before it was a part of the U.S. So Monterey has sort of an Anglo American history. It also has a Spanish and Mexican history. But then Cannery Row, as a specific part of that city, kind of has a history and a culture all its own. But as a lot of scholars and critics have pointed out, this book isn't really about the canneries at all. And it's not about the people who work in the canneries. Instead, you know, we're, we're focused on these different types of characters who, again, aren't really the steady work, nine to five, lunch pail, you know, clocking in at the factory every day. That's not really the milieu that we're in. That's not really the types of characters that we're spending time with. Of course, with the exception of Doc. I mean, Doc is a, you know, a scientist. He's somebody who exists kind of in the professional world, but most of the other characters, you know, really don't. So a lot of critics have pointed this out and they say, really, Cannery Row is just kind of a backdrop. It's not necessarily the focus, at least, you know, the canneries themselves and that type of work. It's not really the focus. Instead, we're looking at the margins. We're looking kind of outside the bounds of traditional, respectable American life. And, you know, we're sort of searching for something different. But we also notice the great interconnectedness of life and how everything is sort of connected, different levels different people, and different walks of life. So that's a theme that we might see at work, but we also can certainly consider the setting. And by considering the setting, we can think about historical context, we can think about cultural context, and then that also connects back to our biographical approach because we know that Steinbeck knows this place and he was present in this place during the time period that's being depicted here in the novel. So that's what I mean. Let the biographical approach take you to some other interesting places. Don't just stop with the author. And like I've said, a lot of the good biographical approach with this novel has kind of already been done. The Ricketts stuff, again, sort of plumbing Steinbeck's own personal history, his own sort of California history. We've done that. So at this point, we can use some of those findings to maybe help us do some other kinds of analytical work. All right, so that's probably enough, you know, for the biographical approach. Again, we can use it. We're not writing biographies. That's not really the work that we do in literary study because we generally want to focus on the text first and foremost. Um, even if we're using context-based approaches other approaches, we still want to treat the text as our primary focus, but sometimes parts of the author's bio can help us to make claims, it can provide evidence, it can help fuel our analysis if we have good connections to work with, and there are some good ones here and in much of Steinbeck's work. A lot of authors don't draw as much from their own personal biography. Steinbeck just happens to be one of the authors who does in some interesting ways.
Okay, so I just wanted to mention a few other things that we can look for and think about in this book. Just some things that critics have mentioned, uh, some stuff that's been talked about, written about before. Again, you might stumble upon some of this if you do some research into this particular work. But I just want to give you guys some ideas, some things that you might want to pursue in your own analysis. But I want to start by just sort of... Uh, encouraging you to not get too hung up on the plot. One thing that you will notice about this book is it's not necessarily tightly plotted. And this is a characteristic that's often observed in Steinbeck's Monterey fiction. Uh, it's present in Tortilla Flat. It's present in Sweet Thursday. There is a plot. I mean, we could piece it together. Events happen. There is a certain chronology at work. We have pretty large casts of characters. You know, we meet people. We see them do things. Things do happen. But generally, it's considered to be sort of loosely structured or loosely plotted. Uh, and a lot of critics have pointed out that there's not really a clear resolution. Uh, unlike a lot of fiction, there might not always be a completely clear direction or purpose here. Uh, figuring that stuff out is largely left up to the reader. So that's part of the reason a lot of uh, instructors and professors like this book and a literature class like this because it's not super plot heavy and there aren't a whole lot of super obvious morals to the story because those are the things we typically notice first and it's okay at that early stage where we're just sort of responding processing what we've read we always sort of reconstruct the plot make sure we understand everything that's happened and then we try to locate some of the big themes and of course that's always fine to do but you'll you'll notice with this book that we don't need to spend a whole lot of time analyzing the plot and in terms of theme, larger meaning, it is pretty open-ended. So there's a lot of room for interpretation. We don't need to get bogged down in the plot. It's not a thriller. It's not a whodunit. So the plot, while it does exist and it does matter and it can be tracked and broken down, it doesn't need to be the end-all be-all. We really need to focus on some other things. I wanted to kind of turn our attention to some other things. And before we leave criticism and theory behind, let me just mention one final context-based approach that might really come in handy here, and that would be ecological criticism, often known as eco-crit for short. Uh, I really did mean to include this when we were talking about our context-based approaches back in week nine, but I think I just ran out of time or I forgot. I just got distracted with all of the other approaches, but this one would work well here. So in a really basic sense, eco-criticism just concentrates on the relationship between literature and the environment. So in a lot of his Monterey fiction and in some of his other fiction set in slightly different places, Steinbeck's often interested in the natural world. He's interested in man's interaction with nature. And of course, we see a lot of that through the character of Doc in this particular text. So there's a lot to think about with the tidal pools and the specimens and the kind of work that Doc is doing. You could dive more into nature and sort of that interaction between characters and the natural world. So typically eco-crit people, eco-criticism scholars can sort of do, they can kind of take one of two general directions with a lot of their work. On one hand, they can sort of study the literature of authors who might be considered in various ways like nature writers. <laughs> and that's kind of a broad category, but, you know, authors like Henry David Thoreau or Annie Dillard or Verlin Klinkenborg, they often write about nature. They often write about ways that mankind sort of alters nature or harms nature or, you know, just sort of 
uh, coexists in some uneasy ways with nature. So if we think of those authors as nature writers, you know, any analysis we do involving them is going to get us in touch with some ecological themes, right? We're going to think about ecosystems or animals, <laughs> you know, various types of flora and fauna, uh, and that's fair game. But the other thing they can do is sort of think more about how nature gets depicted in literary texts. Uh, how does nature get presented in literature? So if that's more the angle, you don't have to focus exclusively on authors who are considered nature writers. Uh, and, you know, some people might consider Steinbeck to be a little bit of a nature writer. I don't think he's typically categorized that way, sort of first and foremost. But you can find any work, any author, any work of literature that depicts nature in some kind of way, any kind of ecosystem, any different kind of environment, uh, and just sort of figure out what's going on with that depiction of nature. What are we supposed to think about it? What function does it play within the, the text? There's often going to be certain metaphors, sort, you know, certain symbols, or even sources of tension, or maybe paradox, that come from nature. Or perhaps to put it more uh, precisely, they might arise from the interaction between nature and mankind. So you could maybe explore a little bit of that here. Again, mostly focusing on Doc, focusing on uh, the sections of the book where we're sort of with him, with his work, observing some of the natural world that he's closely attached to. So an eco-critical approach could be productive here. It's not going to be productive in every text. If nature doesn't really play much of a role, then you probably don't want to pursue eco-crit unless maybe a larger point is that nature has been destroyed or nature has been completely subordinated to you know some kind of huge man-made thing but with books where we get certain scenes or moments in nature or when nature seems to fulfill a metaphorical or symbolic function and hint hint it probably does here anytime we see something like that you know, an ecological approach could be, uh, you know, viable. And there's a lot of eco-crit getting done right now. Uh, this is a very popular context-based approach. So it's fair game. And I think if you look through my notes, it is included in there, even though I did not talk about it in lecture. But I'll double check. If it's not in there, I'll add it uh, this week. Okay. So that's probably enough. Uh, let's just kind of get back into the novel and talk a little bit about a few other things to look for, consider, and analyze. So going back just to the plot, again, not a heavily plotted, tightly plotted novel. And one thing some critics have pointed out is that the plot sort of gives way to almost, at times at least, the plot gives way to almost like a different mode of narrative. And sometimes this is referred to as kind of a visionary state, and it's often seen in what a lot of critics have called the interchapters. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. It's something that we might miss initially, but if you go back, you'll, you'll notice this, and maybe you noticed it as you were reading. But from time to time uh, in the book, we have certain chapters that um, don't really seem directly connected to the main thrust of the plot. So critics have pointed this out, that these so-called inner chapters often seem to interrupt the plot. And they force us to sort of, as readers, they force us to kind of adjust our perspective. Because in these inner chapters, we're often getting a multitude of different perspectives. So this is kind of an interesting observation that some other critics, you know, critics and scholars have made in the past. Uh, but I just want to share a little bit of this from the critical intro to my edition. Just a nice way of thinking about these inner chapters. And I'll give you a few examples of what we're talking about. Some inner chapters that you can go back and find. But this is just the way one critic puts it. Uh, 
if the inner chapters often seem to have only a tangential or sort of distant relation to the action, that is because Steinbeck is challenging his readers to comprehend multiple perspectives presented in a variety of different fictional modes. So again, we get a whole bunch of different kind of little mini narratives. They often seem very separate from the plot. So we get a little satiric portrait of Josh Billings, who I believe is a real person taken from history. We get the whole gopher thing, which is kind of a parody. We get a heavily metaphorical inner chapter about the word. Capital W, the word. You should remember that one. Uh, then there's the sort of almost like journalistic episode about the flagpole sitter. <laughs> so those are all things that we see in some of the inner chapters. And the critic goes on to say that these, you know, each inner chapter is, quote, a little period of rest when time, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually Steinbeck's description. Um, a little era of rest when time stops and examines itself. So that's kind of an interesting way to think about it. Again, we're sort of stopping our regular narrative time to a certain extent. We're kind of stopping that forward chronological progression of the, the, the actual plot. And we're reflecting. Time stops and examines itself. So the scholar doing the intro goes on to say, and during these times, as we're resting and whatever, examining, we can also examine many of Steinbeck's central themes, many of the major messages or themes at work in the text kind of show up in these inner chapters. And the way this, the scholar puts it, they show up in miniature. They're like miniature versions of larger themes that are getting sort of expressed or teased out over the course of the entire text. So individual inner chapters, uh, you know, some of these short chapters that get us away from the major narrative action. And we're suddenly dealing with like characters that seem apart from the major action, or in some cases, Steinbeck does talk a little bit about history, uh, previous things that have happened in Monterey. So whenever we find ourselves in a place like that, that's ripe for analysis. Those inner chapters are ripe for analysis. And, and the, the same scholar says somewhere else that in those inner chapters, that's where the plot sort of melts away and we're almost in a more sort of visionary state. And in this way, Steinbeck's been compared to another great American uh, author, uh, Herman Melville, who's been said to do this as well, uh, most famously in Moby Dick, where we get a multitude of perspectives, different characters, the perspectives of different people, in some cases even minor characters who we might not really see much of for the rest of the novel, but for one brief moment, we're seeing things through their eyes. We're experiencing something that they have experienced. So critics have picked up on this, and this is a characteristic that has often been discussed in relation to Melville. People say in Moby Dick, yeah, there's a plot, uh, but we often wander away from the plot. And in the chapters where we do that, we kind of get away from the main narrative action, and that's when the plot gives way to a more visionary state. Maybe it's more philosophical. Maybe we're reflecting on bigger questions. Again, we're uncovering bigger themes, but we're sometimes doing things that we're spending time with characters or we're in places that seem different or maybe even trivial or like she says, sort of tangential, like unrelated to the main plot, but they're all important. They're giving us different perspectives, different sort of insights or pieces of information, but it all adds up to something. And that takes us to another sort of central theme that's been identified here. I've already kind of mentioned it, but the interconnectedness of life uh, and also the idea of perception, seeing. How do we see? What do we see? And do we see the true reality? Uh, or the, the true nature of things. So the nature of perception, 
I think is interesting to Steinbeck. And that's another way that he's been linked to Melville because Melville was another author who often was interested in perception, how readers would perceive things on the page and how uh, authors could offer a multitude of different perspectives. And we often think nowadays from our modern perspective that that's really one of the perhaps one of the bigger benefits of reading literature is being able to, to get access to different types of characters, different kinds of experiences, different types of perspectives. Uh, and again, the inner chapters are doing that because we have to adjust and adapt to these other characters, these other moments in time. Uh, and that has interesting effects on readers. So that might give you a chance to think a little bit more about reader response what is the effect of adjusting our perspective? What is the effect of giving us a lot of different perspectives to kind of chew on, process, and consider? So those are a few things you could do. Uh, another thing worth considering is, again, the idea of realism or mimesis. So mimesis just means sort of accurately capturing a particular time and place. Uh, so we just often think of this as realism, and this is sometimes thought of as a particular genre or style of literature. And this is something we touched on way back in the early part of the semester when we were discussing some of these strategies for analysis. And just one of the many things I mentioned that we could explore would be genre. Because a lot of the things we find in a particular literary text might be characteristics or traits of a particular genre, a larger category or group that we can place that text within. And that can often be a productive thing to do. We can compare it to other texts that belong to that same genre. We can make observations or claims about the genre. Uh, so realism is a notoriously tricky uh, generic category to sort of wrap our minds around. Some people think of it as a genre. Others just think that realism is a characteristic of certain genres. So I don't think it really matters where we fall in that camp, but we do need to think about some of the ways that Steinbeck is creating a realistic portrait of a particular place, particular people, and a particular time period. So some scholars have talked about how he captures the mood of this place. The exact quote is, he captures the mood of the locale. The locale being this particular part of Monterey, California, in this sort of, you know, 1930s, 1940s era. So what does that mean, though? Like, we can say, yeah, he captures it, he nails it. That, like we've seen, can sort of get us into a little bit of a biographical study. He knows this place. Uh, we can think about episodes from his life that he might have been able to draw upon. But the, the more productive work would be to get into the text and to find specific devices, specific elements that help him to express this realistic vision. So some of that comes from dialogue. Some of that comes from description provided by Steinbeck's narrator, the way he captures certain places, the way things look. But we should also think about certain aspects of Steinbeck's style, his own sentence structure, his own syntax, his own tone, his own voice. And then we could think about the voice uh, the voices of the many different characters. Again, going back to dialogue. How does he write dialogue? How does the dialogue capture the people? And then we can also think about some of the larger themes and how they might be rooted to certain realities of this time and place and these people that he is depicting. So don't just think about it like, oh yeah, it's realistic because he's from there. That surface level, that's a place to start. But then you need to, you know, sort of go beneath the surface and find those specific devices, those specific elements, whether that's character, whether that's individual lines of dialogue, individual sentences given to us by the narrator, uh, whether it's simply the way the setting is described. But also look for symbols. 
Look for important metaphors. Look for patterns. We have a lot of experience by now looking for patterns in poetry, but as I've said before, we can also look for patterns in prose fiction, in novels, in short stories. We can look for patterns in anything. So what are our patterns? What are the recurring features that run through the text? We can think of them as motifs, things that keep showing up. They're features that run through the entire text and have some kind of significance that we can explore. Um, so there's a lot here, again, just like, don't forget about our literary elements. Don't forget about all of our strategies, all the material that we've covered. We can use all of it when we approach this book. We can take our surface to depth approach. We can look for patterns, look for opposites, think about historical context as I've already done. We can think about genre Think about the social relevance. Steinbeck is sometimes thought of as a little bit of a political writer. Uh, many of his texts do have sort of political or social messages. It's up for debate whether this one does. <laughs> Grapes of Wrath did. He wrote a book called In Dubious Battle, uh, which was also set in California. It was about farm workers going on strike uh, and demanding higher wages and better treatment. So some of his fiction was clearly dealing with social and political issues of the time period. Does this one? Maybe, certainly not in the kind of obvious overt way that Grapes of Wrath does, but maybe there is some commentary. We've talked about several different critical or theoretical lenses that you could take, a little bit of biographical, a little bit of the new historicist approach if you want to think about historical context. But then we mentioned EcoCrit. You know, if you really want to focus on Doc and the marine biology, you could take the EcoCrit angle as well. Uh, but also, don't forget about just our typical literary elements. Think about characters, setting, a little bit about plot, sure, some of the larger themes, but also things like time, uh, irony. Tension, uh, specific word choice, particularly words that get repeated. We can think about sound, the sound of dialogue, the sounds that get described, uh, but also Steinbeck's tone. Think about comedy. How do we, you know, what are the comedic moments here? Do we see comedy as a part of this larger uh, sort of creation? Uh, think about realism, think about Monterey, uh, and you can even think a little bit about Steinbeck himself. All right, so I want to conclude uh, today's lecture. I'll keep it relatively short this week, but I just want to mention sort of our final thought when it comes to criticism and theory, and that is entering a critical conversation. I've mentioned this before, but it's time that we start doing this. <laughs> so I want to remind you of it now because I'm going to sort of turn you guys loose. Now that we've covered all of our critical approaches, it's really up to you guys to pick a couple or maybe just one that you want to use on the final paper. And eventually, you're going to need to start conducting some research. So I'm going to talk more about that next week. In fact, next week's lecture is really all about our final paper and how to get moving on the research component for that paper. So that's really the week 12 lecture. But I just want to talk a little bit more conceptually about sort of what this process is and how I want you guys to approach it. So maybe you've heard this before and you've kind of gotten this spiel maybe in 203 or in a previous literature class, but it really is important. Once you've selected the text that you're going to write about and you have an idea about what kind of critical approach you might want to use, a lot of your research will be sort of based on getting you acquainted with what other people have said about your chosen text. What have other scholars and critics already done? Read articles that have already been written about the text. Just get familiar. Get acquainted with the ongoing debates that might surround the text. 
you know, things that people have been arguing about, things that, you know, uh, what have they been writing about in relation to that text? You need to know, you're not going to be an expert, you're not going to have time to read it all, especially if you're working with a pretty famous text that has been studied and analyzed a lot. But you need to familiarize yourself with the general critical conversation that's been going on around your text. And if you're reading anything uh, from previous centuries, something from the early to mid 20th century, even a famous text, maybe from the late 20th century or early 21st, there's going to be a critical conversation. There's a lot of critical conversations around this book. Now, if you get more contemporary and you choose a text that just came out recently, there might be a less robust critical conversation just because the text hasn't been around as long and people haven't had as much time to write about it and argue about it. But if it's a well-known text that was well-received critically, if it's been taught, if it's been anthologized, if it's been around and celebrated for a long time, you can just assume that there's going to be an ongoing critical conversation. And even if it's more contemporary and it hasn't been around as long, still there's probably something out there. There's at least maybe a couple of articles, a couple of reviews. Uh, some people have talked about it, have written about it. So that's really one of your first missions as you embark on the literary research paper. And now that we're finished with our third critical response, we can turn our attention pretty much exclusively to our final paper. And that's really what you need to do soon. This week, certainly into next week, let's get familiar with the critical conversation surrounding our chosen text. And then really what you have to do is just sort of find a way to enter that conversation yourself. Uh, you have to find an entry point. You have to sort of find your way in. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Sometimes it's thought of as like finding a gap, finding something that's missing in that critical conversation. Like, okay, this has been covered, that's been covered, but this other aspect of the text, this particular character, this particular symbol, this particular scene, this stuff has not been covered. All right, These particular items, they've not been talked about. They've been excluded from the critical conversation or they've been overlooked. So in some cases, the way some people approach it is to find omissions, to find gaps, find potential analysis that's been missing, uh, things that haven't been looked at as closely, and that could be your entry point. Okay, so maybe you think, all right, Doc's been done to death, uh, but maybe there's another character, maybe a minor character, or just somebody who's been written about less, but they have a certain importance, they do a certain thing that I don't think previous critics have really noticed. So you are filling in the gap. You are addressing an omission that previously existed in the critical conversation around that text. So that could be one way to go. Another way to go might be to simply disagree with some of the critics, some of the scholars who have already done work on your chosen text. Maybe as you're researching and you're reading some of their articles and book chapters, you're like, you know what? I don't think they're reading this character right. I don't think they're interpreting some of the central themes correctly. I think they're misreading that metaphor or that symbol, whatever, right? If you disagree with something big, something small, something in between, that can be your entry point. That can be your way into that larger critical conversation. You can really respond to other critics. You can provide your own interpretation sort of as a counterpoint to what somebody else has already done. Another approach that can be a little bit difficult but fruitful uh, if you're able to pull it off is you can kind of start by agreeing with some of the work that's already been done, but then maybe find a way to add to it. 
Let's take it a step further. Let's do something new with it. So you might accept some of the sort of dominant interpretations or readings that critics and scholars have already offered. But then you say, okay, I'm going to do something a little bit different with this idea. Maybe I'm going to apply it to some real world situation. Maybe I want to compare it to some other text. Or maybe I just want to place it in a slightly different context so we can look at it in a slightly different way. That could be your way in. Um, and again, with a really contemporary text, you might just really want to get the ball rolling on a critical conversation if you don't think much of one really exists at the present moment. If you're looking at a poem or a short story that just came out a few years ago, Again, it's probably at least been reviewed. It's probably been at least talked about. If it shows up in our book, that means it's been anthologized, right? It appears in at least one uh, literature textbook and probably others, and it's probably been published in a few other places. So that means people have read it. And that usually means there's at least a couple of reviews, maybe a couple of critical assessments, maybe not full-blown literary study, uh, again, if it hasn't been around that long, but people maybe have at least been talking about it, or you might find a, a brief review uh, in a magazine or maybe even a newspaper and that can you know still be helpful to read but if you don't feel like there's been a lot of literary analysis conducted on a particular text well you can step in and fill that void and sort of you know set some of the parameters and really set a lot of the terms of the critical conversation that might ensue. So it just depends. Again, if you're working with something well-known and older, the critical conversation already exists. And often the challenge is simply just learning about it and finding out how you can enter into it. Um, but that is a process. It doesn't necessarily happen overnight. So I just encourage you to be patient, you know, get really comfortable with your text first and then have your own response, you know, have your own emotional response to the text before you start consulting other sources, before you start reading other people's interpretations, have at least a rough sketch of your own reading, your own understanding of the text. And again, it can be largely based on the emotions you felt, uh, how you like it, how you feel about it, how you read certain characters, how it resonates with you, what it makes you think of. That's all fair game and arrive just at some rough draft of your own interpretation and then start consulting the critics, the scholars, the people who have already done a lot of work on that text and then you'll be able to arrive at your original argument, the original argument that you're going to make in the paper. Again, it can be sort of oppositional. It can be based on agreement. It can be based on a gap or an omission. You can be trying to sort of repurpose some already existing ideas. There's a lot of ways you can go, but you need to start with your own ideas, then get comfortable with the critical conversation that's going on. That's really what research helps you do in the early stages of the research. You get familiar, you know what people are saying, and then you can start finding the sources that you're actually going to use in your paper. So I encourage you to kind of cast a wide net when you start looking at sources. And you can just start with Google. I recommend Google Scholar. Maybe some of you did that and you know, used that database in 102 or a previous lit class. But instead of just regular Google, Google Scholar will yield better, more academic results. But eventually, and we'll talk about this next week, I want you guys to use the GBC library databases a little bit as well so we can find academic sources from literature journals, you know, from scholars. And a lot of that stuff will end up providing us with good evidence that we can use for our own claims in our papers. So 
early on, I think you should view research as kind of exploratory. You're just learning. You should read a lot and just understand that larger critical conversation that surrounds your text. Not everything that you're going to read during that exploratory phase will end up being a source that you actually use on your paper. But once you've learned a little bit more about the critical conversation, you can start thinking more about how you're going to contribute, how you're going to enter it, and then you can start picking the sources that you want, the sources that are going to show up on your Works Cited page, and of course you'll use them in the paper. So just keep that in mind. You have to enter this conversation or you have to start a conversation. Somehow or another, you need to contribute something new to the study of your chosen text. You have to provide something new, something original, something that can either spark further debate, something that can participate in an ongoing debate, something that could maybe create a new debate, uh, or just a new perspective, a fresh angle, a new take on something that other people have looked at, but you have your own way of reading and interpreting it. So just think about that. You're bringing something new to the table. That's how you should view your interpretation and use some of these critical approaches to help you achieve that goal. All right, so next week, I really do want to get into research in more detail. We'll talk about the databases. We'll talk about some specific uh, literature journals uh, that you might want to keep in mind because they're going to give you good sources. And, you know, we'll just mention a few other places where you can look so we can get our research up and running. But we also need to start thinking about our topics. So one thing you notice is after we finish Cannery Row, we don't have any more required readings for the semester. So at this point, I, I've given you everything that I'm going to give you to read. So I would really like you to start making some choices. Uh, I'm going to open it up to anything in our book. It doesn't matter if I've assigned it or not, but certainly you can choose something that I have assigned or if you just discovered another text that we didn't read as a class, but it's in the book, you like it, you're interested in it, you want to analyze it, that's fine. But really by the end of week 12, by the end of next week, you need to have a topic in mind. That means the text that you are going to write about. You don't have to know what your argument is yet, but you need to know what you're going to write about and you need to start doing some research about that text. Okay, so get in touch with me if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will see you next week.